Let me just start off by saying this. Rarely is the topic of the believer's work ethic spoken of in church. How many times have you heard a sermon about a believer's work ethic at church? Many of you have been in church 30, 40 years. Can you count them on one hand? How many, to- how many messages that you've heard about a believer's work ethic? How much time is spent of your life at work? We hear a lot about evangelism and discipleship. We hear a lot about the cross and salvation and justification and glorification. And these are all great things. And they're important things for us to know. But Paul takes the time to write about the importance of our relationships and our workplace to the Ephesians. Except he doesn't quite speak of it as the employer-employee, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But it should catch our attention that we should pay some attention because of all the hours that we spend. Many of you are spending more than the average eight hour a day at your workplace. Many of you are spending nine, ten, plus hours there. So if you do the simple math, and I'm assuming some of you are at least getting eight hours of sleep, how much of your time is spent at work? And how much time do you actually have for family life? Most of your life is spent at your workplace. That is where you're rubbing shoulders with people. That is where you're having conversations. That is where you're meeting new people. A lot's going on there, isn't there? And yet, the areas of the Scripture where it talks about our work ethic, we need to stop and listen and hear what the Apostle has to say. Generally, employees are demanding more and more pay for less and less work. We want greater benefits. We want a smaller workload. We want less hours. We want longer vacations. And it seems like the employer wants just the opposite. They are demanding more production for less pay with less benefits, and they want more control of our lives. Some companies even go so far as to, if you will, make a place of home at the workplace. Go there and get your shower, get your exercise equipment, get your, get your entertainment, and get all your food without ever having to leave the main building. Huh. And yet, why is there a continued conflict between the employer and the employee? At the writing of this letter, there were millions upon millions of slaves in the Roman Empire. In the Greek and the Roman culture, slaves had no legal right. They were treated as commercial commodities. Slaves were bought, sold, and traded. They were used and then discarded as if they were no more than mere animals. Some masters did grieve over the fact when they lost a slave, but that was really the exception. It was not the rule. Cato writes of one in which he says, If your slave becomes sick, do not feed him. What a waste of money. Juvenile writes of one slave owner who delighted in the listening of their slave being beaten. And then one owner writes about how he cast his slave into a pond filled with lamprey eels that sliced the the slave to pieces only because the slave broke a glass. I share this with you because I think it's important for us to come away with the idea that slaves were treated as nothing, as a tool, although a flesh and blood tool, but still a tool in the day that Paul lived. And yet, here we find in Scriptures where the New King James says bondservant. The reality is it's slaves. And slaves lived with the people in their homes. Now you and I, in our day and age, we don't have any slaves living at our home. And oftentimes in the American culture, when we think of slaves, our mind goes back to a time period called the Civil War. 
that's not the same time period or the same type of things that were taking place in Paul's time period. In Paul's time period, the slaves actually lived in the same home that the masters lived in or the slave owners. They didn't live down the road or in a shack outside somewhere. So, that's important for us to grasp. But now Paul, he preaches the gospel. He preaches the gospel of salvation to, to any man who's blind, by, blinded by their sin and under the power of Satan. And some of these people respond and their eyes are open. And they are freed from the power of Satan. And they are asking the question of, if I've been freed in Christ, if I am now a child of God, shouldn't I demand my rights? Shouldn't justice be carried out against a master who's been unfair to me? And modern day reader looks at the Scripture and says, doesn't the Scripture say that slavery is evil and bad? And isn't Paul calling for a rebellion against the Roman Empire to end all slavery? But that's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul's letter to the Ephesians speaks to the main issue that affects every slave. And it speaks to the main issue that affects every employee and every employer. It's not about rights. It's not about pay or benefits. But it is about our relationship to God. You see, Paul's primary concern is what is your relationship with the Lord? Man is always concerned about his relationship with fellow man. And Paul says, don't be so concerned about your relationship with fellow man. Be concerned about your relationship with God. That is the primary thing that everyone needs to deal with. So this morning, every one of us will have a chance to answer three questions as we study this passage together. The first does God require obedience? That's our first question. The second question is, has God revealed His will? Specifically in this context. And third, does God reward good works? So as we begin this, you can see we're working for God. That's the, the overall passage that we're looking at. Does God require obedience? In verse 5, it says, Bond servants or slaves... Be obedient to those who are, who are your masters according to the flesh. The same word that where he says obedient is the same word that he's referring to back in verse 1 where he says, children, obey your parents. It's the exact same word that's used. So as he was talking to children, now children, listen to your parents. What does that mean, obey? obey? It means to hear with your ears, not yeah, yeah, I hear you, but I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to do what you're telling me. It's I'm listening with the intent of now obeying and doing what you're telling me. So when the boss comes and says, I need you to do this, 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 and this, you're going, all right, I got it, and I'm going to go do it. That's that idea of obedience. Doing what you're told to do when you're told to do it. Not, well, I'll do it when I feel like I'm going to do it. No, that's not obedience. Obedience means to listen to, to give attention to. And it requires that you hear the person that's speaking and then you comply or you yield to their words. And in doing so, you recognize that the one that's talking is an authority over you. It's interesting that Paul says and adds this phrase, according to the flesh. He says that you obey the one that's according to the flesh. So there's this connection, and it implies something that's greater. So Paul is telling the employee, if you don't mind me using that term, employee, listen to your boss according to the flesh, which also implies what? If you have a boss according to the flesh, what else do you have? Well, there's a boss according to what? There must be a boss. If there's a boss according to flesh, then there must be a boss that's higher up. 
There must be one that's not only according to the flesh, but there must be a boss that's over the flesh, over the spirit. Who's the boss of all relationships? Now, let me just stop right there and let's go back and take a few steps back and review a little bit. Paul tells us clear back in chapter 5. He tells us in verse 15. He says, see that you walk. See that you live wisely. Not as fools, but as wise. So make sure that you are walking carefully, circumspectly. Make sure you walk in such a way that you're walking not as a fool would walk, but you'd walk as a wise person would walk. So how does a Christian walk wisely? In verse 18, we're told that a wise Christian is a Christian who says, I'm going to listen to what the Holy Spirit tells me to do, and I'm going to yield to the Holy Spirit. So imagine you're driving in the car with your mom and dad. And it comes to a sign that says yield. Yield means to yield. You look and you see, is there a car coming? If there is, you yield to it. If there's no car, you keep going. Right? The same thing with the Holy Spirit. The whole, you're going, I'm yielding to the Holy Spirit. I'm going about my life. And the Holy Spirit says, all right, let's stop. Let's get, let's get things under control here. But that person just did this, and I'm going, no, no, wait a minute. Don't respond in the flesh. Don't respond in anger. How would Christ respond? Oh, okay. Let me see. Oh, a verse comes to my mind. A soft word turns away wrath. My fault. My apologies. I'm sorry I cut you off. Ah. So instead of turning into road rage or a parking lot fist brawl, now all of a sudden it's the other person says, yeah, no problem. Or maybe they just turn around and discuss, yeah, you're, you're an idiot, and they walk away. That's yielding. The wise person learns to yield to the Holy Spirit who allows the Holy Spirit to be in control and control what they are doing. So we go back to chapter 6, verse 5, where we are to be obedient to our masters. We're learning to be obedient to our employer. It's not just being obedient. It's also making sure that do we have the right attitude. So we're looking at obedience. It means we want to listen. We want to hear what it means. We want to do what's right. But it's also what's the attitude of obedience. We know what the subject is. And we know what the object of the sentence is It's because it's so clearly defined. But Paul says, make sure that you are obedient to your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of the heart. Does this mean that when we come to our bosses that we're supposed to say, boss, I'm afraid of you. Please be good to me. Now, from the examples that I gave you, if you were a slave in Rome, you might have some cause to have fear and trembling. Because your life is literally in their hand. There was no law that said that a, Rome, a Roman couldn't buy you and then kill you. He's just out his money. But how does that translate into where we're at today? This eye of fear and trembling. It's the idea of respect. It's the idea of showing the right attitude of the heart. Do we honor our boss? Is there genuineness? Is there honesty in our, in our attitude towards him or her? Do we view the relationship between our employer as one of adversary? Of a confrontation? Or is it sacred? Do we see this as a, as a special type of union in which God has placed us in this position? Because we can't leave verse 5 without underlining or highlighting the last part of this verse where it says, unto Christ. When we see the sacredness of this relationship, that changes the element of fear 
and enters into this, that enters into this relationship, and we're no longer seeing this as a relationship of just, he's my boss, and he's the bad guy, or she's the bad guy, and it turns around and says, wait a minute, I, that's my, my employer, that's my boss, and I am supposed to obey that person just as if I was to obey Christ, and I'm supposed to have the same type of attitude just as if I was listening to Christ. I think, well, how does that work? Well, let's take, take a couple steps back in the other relationships we've looked at. Wives are to submit to their husbands. How? As unto the Lord. Husbands are to love their wives. How? As they love Christ. Parents. Are, well, I'll get to parents in just a second. Children are to obey their parents. How? As unto the Lord. Parents. Parents, you are to... You are to discipline your children. How? In the Lord. So all of these relationships are required upon us to do things as we would in Christ Jesus, in the Lord. Not in the flesh, not in anger, but as we would do with, as if Christ is standing there right there with us. So as we're going back and saying, my attitude, what is my attitude in my, towards my boss what is my attitude towards Christ? Oh, he just gave me some work. I have a horrible boss. Ah! No? Really? Do you think of Christ that way? Well, no, because he's God and he sees everything. All right. Take a look at the relationship for a moment. Your boss has been placed there by the Lord God over you. You're required in this relationship to obey that person and have a certain type of attitude just as if Christ was there right there and He was giving you the instruction. And this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to get out to everyone. Employees, obey those who are over you in the flesh with honor, with respect, in, in sincerity, be genuine, just as if you were obeying Christ. As God revealed His will in this area, look at verse 6. He says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ or as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as the Lord and not to men. What's the aim of your work? What's the end result of your job that you're doing? Why do you work? Money. That is a good reason. Why do you need money? You need money to live. Any other reason that you work? Okay, it makes you happy. You need food on the table. So you, you want to have something to eat. Okay? Any, anything else? You want to have something to do. Okay. All right. Anything else? You feel useful when you work. Okay? All right? It's fulfilling. Okay? Uli mentioned and said that it's part of the garden. Right. So when man fell in sin, then we got work. Because how many of you curse the 40-hour work week? <laughs> You're absolutely right. There was work. You see, when God placed us in the garden before Genesis 3, God placed us in there to tend and care for the garden. Work was intended by God. God had placed that for man. And then after the fall, we're still told that man is in the garden, or he's out of the garden, but he's still to work. The difference is that by the sweat of his brow, he's going to continue to work, and he's going to find that his work does not have the fulfillment that it once did. He's going to work and sweat, but it seems like it's going to, it's going to be empty. Work maximizes the ability that God had created in man. But being a Christian, shouldn't that make a person a better worker, more productive? more agreeable employee? 
Okay, so let me step on everybody's toes for a little bit. As a Christian in the workplace, shouldn't you be the employee of the month every month? Shouldn't you be the best workers? Because your work should not be characterized by shoddiness, carelessness, complaining, or being late. Because who's going to listen to an employee that's characteristics are identified as that? If you find that your workplace is intolerable, my advice to you is quit and go find another job. But as long as you are working in the places that you are, do your very best. Do it to your best ability. Because who you are working for is going to determine and going to speak the whole volume of the quality of work that you're really putting out. If you're working for your earthly boss, then you're working for the wrong employer. You've seen employees that uh, have worked really hard when the boss is around. They seem to be busy. Dust is flying when the boss is there. But as soon as the, dust, as soon as the boss goes away, it's like, phew, you've never seen a lazier person in your life. That's what Paul means. He says, not with eye service. Not as men pleasers. Not as a suck-up, is what we would call them today. Paul's basically saying, don't be one of those people. But as a servant or as a slave of Christ, that's the kind of work that you're doing. Doing the will of God from the heart. Meaning making sure that you do what you're supposed to do, serving God first, and then by that characteristics, giving 110% at your work. Working like you're serving God. One of, the, one of the things that I, I run into, and I'm going to share this with you, because it may not be universally known. First of all, it is my belief, and I think I can get something from Scripture, Christians should be the one group of people that are hired the most. We should be at the top of the list of most wanted to be hired. Based upon what scripture says that's not always the case i get that but people should be in generally speaking i want a christian to work for me on time stay later don't complain work really hard really that's pretty basic that covers a lot of things not saying they're the smartest not saying they're the sharpest but they're giving it their best and people recognize that I find it somewhat discouraging when I hear other Christians saying I would never hire another Christian. Because they tend to take advantage of other Christians and say, I don't really need to work that hard because my, my boss is already a Christian. Or they start taking advantage of my boss or a boss because, well, you know, they have to be gracious to me. You know, they have to forgive me. Life's not going so good. Hey, Life doesn't go good for anybody, whether you're a Christian or not. You, you're going to have death in the family. You're going you're gonna to face divorce. You're going to have face conflict. You're going to face all these things. That's normal life. But how you respond is everything. And oftentimes I hear, well, you know, I'll find, you'll find a Christian going, well, they're surfing the Internet on the computer or they're on their phones all the time. or going, really? And the boss sees that. Well, your boss is in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees you all the time. He sees what you're doing. He sees when you're talking to people, unrelated work stuff. He sees that you're, you're sharing the gospel with somebody on, on the employee's work time. You're going, really, is that the best time and place to do that? Huh. We should be the best people. The top choice. Now, I mentioned that there should be something, I, I should be able to prove what I'm saying with God's Word. You're in the book of Ephesians, but real quickly, turn your, turn your Bibles to the right, to uh, 1 Timothy. You're going to go through a couple letters. 
First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six, verses one and two. It says, "Let as many slaves as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and His doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them." Because they are brethren, but rather let them serve because those who are benefit are believers and beloved. Teach, exhort these things. So in other words, again, you should be the, we should be the best workers out there. Hardest workers. But unless we think, you know, that's just Paul talking to Timothy. So you can imagine, Paul probably demanded a lot from Timothy. Go to Titus chapter 2. Verse 9, Paul is laying out for Titus and saying, here, this is how you are going to train other people. In verse 9, he says, exhort bond servants or slaves, or in other words, exhort employees to be obedient to their own employers, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing uh, good fidelity, or in other words, loyalty, that they may adorn the, doc- be, that they may adorn the doctrine of, of God, our Savior, in all things. Not being sassy. Not stealing. Huh. Workers steal from their bosses? You know that more than 50% of theft in companies comes from, not from outside, but it comes from inside. Employees. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Your work is, is your work worship or is it idolatry? Your work is to be an act of worship, is, is an act of service to Christ. Ask yourself this question. Is my work good enough to present to Jesus? This week was Grandparents' Day. And Grandparents' Day is a special day where all the grandparents come to the school and they put on a little presentation for the grandparents. And the grandparents are just ood and odd, and they just love seeing their grandkids do their little thing. And then the kids take their grandparents back to their classrooms, and the kids make things. You remember what it's like for your, for your kids to make something. They'll put something like, put their hand on it, uh, up like this, and they'll color something, and this will be a turkey head, and this will be the feathers of a turkey. And you'll look at that, and a parent or a grandparent will look at that and go, that is so precious, that is so beautiful. And they see their kids thing, and they go, this is so wonderful, I'm going to keep it forever. And I look at that, and you probably look at that and go, oh my goodness, that needs to go in the garbage. Right? I mean, we're in church, we need to be honest. But if it's your child that's making that, and you're going, I, that is the best he or she can do. You're very proud of them for what they're doing. And they're thinking of you, and they're doing it for you. And you're cheering them on, and you're thinking, what a great job. I, they're doing things that you, you are teaching them, and you're wanting them to do. To be thoughtful of others, to be thinking of you, to be creative. These are all traits you're trying to encourage. So in your workplace... Is your work the very best that you can do and say, Lord, here, I'm presenting this to you? Now, if you're one of those perfectionists, you say, well, my work is never going to be perfect and blah, blah, blah. Get over yourself. Because you know and I know work has to be done. It has to be turned in. Stop procrastinating and get your stuff done and give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, this is, I'm giving, I'm, I'm doing my best. Here it is. I've got eight hours to get this stuff done. I'm going to work hard in my eight hours. Wait a minute, Facebook came up. Or Snapchat. Or Instagram. Or whatever the things are. Or, oh, I got a bunch of messages from my family this week. I'm going to go. You got eight hours in your day for your boss. Are you giving that and working for that person? For your Lord? Hmm. See, Christ is a standard, not your boss. And you will find that if Christ is your standard, you will find that your job and expectations are going to step up and you are going to work harder 
to get your things done. And you're going you're gonna to waste less time than what you're currently doing. And you're going to find yourself saying less things like, well, the job owes me this because I've been so faithful. No, I, no, I owe everything to Jesus Christ. He owes me nothing. So everything that I'm giving him today is because he's worth it. I'm going to do my best. God's revealed his will in this. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord. That's who we're doing this stuff for. That's who we're working for. Now, does God reward good works? He says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. All of God's rewards are just. But if you work in a workplace where you have, where you have uh, gone unnoticed, your extra work is completely forgotten, or there's times where you feel unappreciated, or you've been bypassed for promotion, or someone else just comes in and completely takes the credit for everything that you've done. Maybe you have felt that, and you have been completely taken advantage of, and, it's, and you know it's unjust. Or maybe your boss is the one who's done all that to you. Paul's reminding us here that, wait a minute, the Lord is the one, not your master, not your employer who's going to reward you. The Lord is the one who's going to reward you. It reminds me of an elderly missionary couple who came back from Africa. They had spent 40 years serving selfishly on the field. When they returned back on the boat, they also shared the same boat with one of our famous presidents, Theodore Roosevelt. He had gone over to Africa on a big game hunt. And upon coming back and arriving at the shore, there were reporters, there were friends, there was a whole bunch of people out there to greet the president. They were asking him questions. How was it? What was it like to shoot these big, big animals? And the president was excited and he was enthusiastic and he was telling them all. And everyone had questions and pretty soon they got off the boat and the whole crowd was following with them. The missionaries got into the, their taxi and headed home. And the man said to the wife, not one question for us. We have spent 40 years of our life sharing the gospel with people, teaching them about Christ. Not one person cares about what we've done. This is completely unfair. That night, once they arrived home, the man felt the Lord pressing on him this thought. You are not home, my child. Your rewards will be given once you arrive. Your rewards are not for here. Your end is not here at this life, believer. All of your hard work is not at the end of retirement. Not at the end of 70 years. Your rewards are when you see Jesus Christ face to face. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And he says, let me show you how I am rewarding you for all of your good works. Not just the things we think, well, I wasn't a pastor, or I didn't lead someone to the Lord. Says, ah, but you were faithful to me at your job. Here's what you did that was right. I have rewards for you. The Lord is not slack. He is not forgetful. He remembers and he sees everything that you do. The question really comes down to, as we close, it's just simply this. Are you working at your job to please your employer or to please Christ? Does your work attitude and your work ethic reflect that you're a believer in Jesus Christ? 
Are there, are there some things that need to change? What needs to be adjusted? Today's a good day to make those adjustments.